Good day, everyone, and welcome. We are so thrilled that you have joined us today. It looks like we have people from all over the world here, and we could not be more thrilled that you've chosen to join us at the International Association of Innovation Professionals new live stream series. I'm Danika Scott. I have been working in marketing uh, for IAYP for a little over three years now. And so today I am coming at you as Brett Trusco, as um, Brett is uh, experiencing a little bit of intermittent internet issues. So I'll be filling in for him. He is online with us, however, and if you do chat, he will see it um, as he is a panelist. But with all that being said, um, I would like to say that we, um, we all know these are challenging times. Uh, we're all uh, experiencing um, a lot of difficulties in addition to trying to have our normal everyday lives as normal as we can. So we, um, we want to recognize that with everyone here. So a couple of quick housekeeping items. You can chat directly with the panelists. There is um, a chat screen below. There is also a Q&A screen, um, that, a Q&A icon, I should say, that will allow you to ask a question. Just so you know, um, Tom won't be answering questions during the, his um, presentation, but we'll reserve them to the end. And he'll also have a way to contact him if your question doesn't get answered. So with that being said, um, if you are a member, um, a professional member, we sincerely thank you for your continued support. These are trying times for all industries, including nonprofits like ourselves. We would encourage you to join us. Um, you will be getting a link to watch this recording afterwards as well. And it will be going into our learning management system where we have many different courses available that you can take. So with that being said, I am going to introduce Tom Brazil. Tom Brazil, um, I've had the pleasure of knowing uh, for over a year now as he is a member of IAYP's Board of Directors. He is also the Chief Digital and Innovation Officer for ICS. I'm not gonna read you his bio, but I will say that he has a tremendous amount of experience in innovation. He is a certified innovation, chief, certified Chief Innovation Officer. And um, because of this, he has made some significant contributions to innovation overall. Tom has written a new book that you can see up on the screen, Agile Innovation uh, Management Systems, and today he's going to be talking about what they are and why they are important. He um, and his wife live in Alabaster, Alabama, and we are coming everyone to you live really from all over the world today. Welcome, we're thrilled you're here. And with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Danica. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely, I can okay. hear you. Like just want to make sure with me. <laughs> okay, thank no you. worries. My All right. apologies. All right. So thank you for the introduction. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, uh, my career in innovation began over 35 years ago. So some kind of a dinosaur, some might say. Uh, it started off in the U U.S. Air Force. Uh, it's been a heck of an enjoyable ride, uh, culminating in my current role as Chief Digital and Innovation Officer at ICS. So. ICS is a 23-year-old uh, veteran-owned business providing uh, innovative and transformative services to the DOD, as well as state and local governments. Uh, regarding IAOIP, uh, I've been associated with them since about 2017, uh, and we were looking for, at ICS, the most knowledgeable and recognized organization when it comes to the science of innovation and innovation thought leadership. So the book to the right of my picture was created as a result of my efforts at obtaining the IAOIP Certified Chief Innovation Officer Cert. And uh, unlike other certs that you can get all over the internet, uh, certifications from IAOIP carry some real weight. Uh, for those that are not familiar with the IAOIP, they are the only nonprofit global organization that's recognized by both the American National Standards Institute and ISO, International Standards Organization. Uh, and they were appointed by ANSI to lead the U.S. Technical Advisory Group to the ISO Technical Committee that creates the ISO 56000 Series of Innovation Management System Guidance Standards. So they also wrote nearly a thousand page Global Innovation Science Handbook, which is the largest innovation body of knowledge anywhere. And they also run the International Journal of Innovation Science. So they're uniquely positioned to examine and evaluate against best practice certification criteria in the various disciplines associated with innovation. So as an example, obtaining the Certified Chief Innovation Officer Cert from IAOIP required two important criteria for evaluation. The first 
was a detailed, uh, providing detailed examples, I would say, of my career in innovation and the contributions to the organizations I've served in innovation leadership roles. And two, it required making an original contribution to the innovation body of knowledge. And that was the reason for my book, Implementing an Agile Innovation Management System, which describes the unique capabilities that my team and I have brought to the world of Agile Innovation Management. And I'll be discussing a few of those uh, concepts later in the presentation. But the overall topic of the webinar is about Agile Innovation Management Systems. And my goal is to address the characteristics of an effective Agile Innovation Management System, while also providing some background on why they're so important in this era of accelerated change. So let's get started. So I found that presenting the topics that I cover as a series of short stories that tie together and build upon concepts that are introduced has been a very effective and engaging way of transferring information. So that's the approach I'm gonna to use today, a series of three short but important stories. And we're gonna start with a pace of change story in order to contextualize what exponential change really means in a way we can all readily grasp, which will help to set the stage and underscore why agility and in innovation management is essential. In the second story, it's a case for change story. It discusses where most organizations are today and why it's untenable for both business and government to remain in the status quo, and along with the benefits of the ISO innovation management guidance standards. And the third story, is an agility story. And it brings together the concepts you need to consider for adeptly managing the pace of change in terms of agile innovation management. So story number one, let's get rolling. This is a story about the exponential pace of change. And when I get questions related to the pace of change, I find that not everyone can bring the discussion into their own context in a meaningful way. And for me personally, having been around for a while as a dinosaur, my technical career started you know, 35 years ago. I was writing assembler programs on 80 column Hollerith punch cards, feeding them into mainframes. And today my innovation team is working on machine learning and artificial intelligence and convolutional neural networks. And in between those two data points, there's been an enormous amount of change. So I can contextualize the exponential pace of change because I've experienced it in meaningful ways. But there are many in the workplace today that began their professional careers within the last 10 to 12 years, which is after even the iPhone was introduced. And while they experience a frenzied pace of change, they have not experienced the number of equilibrium jumps that those of us who've been around a bit longer have experienced. And that doesn't mean they're immune. The effects that they will experience will be far more pronounced than those that I have. So I find it useful to provide some easily digestible visualizations that will help everyone contextualize the pace of change and then consider the potential impacts to business, the economy, technology, and society. So the first story starts off with a cute little deer in a meadow eating its breakfast without a care in the world. And this is the world before digital transformation and accelerated pace of change as is the case with all exponential series though, it takes a good number of iterations before the trend away from the baseline becomes apparent. So I'll be giving an example following this part that shows an exponential number series that will help people contextualize this point. But what I've found anecdotally is that the more disruption you have faced, the easier it is to recognize from where and from when the next one is coming. And those that are especially in tune with leading indicators may notice that drastic change is afoot, but others do not. In fact, many do not. So today, to survive, you must deal with constant threats, whether they're from competitors or in the case of governments, from adversaries. Uh, and the ever-increasing pace of change leads to a state of heightened alert, which can help us to identify both risks and opportunities. So to thrive today, you need the ability to execute continuous threat assessments, like this deer whose independent ear swivels can locate threats from various vectors, or its 270 degree eyesight coverage, so it can focus not only on what is in front of it, but also threats from the periphery. And if that's not enough to identify threats that you can't see or hear, the tacit threats, the hidden threats that are over the horizon that you have to smell from a mile away, when that threat is detected, you have 
four possible outcomes. First, if you're well positioned with differentiating solutions and the resources to compete, you can stand your ground and fight off the competition. Second, you can abandon your position. Like Jack Welch said, you be number one or be number two or get out. And this is especially true today if the market you're in is mature and there's little opportunity for growth due to innovation. Of course, you can identify opportunities for innovation and having the ability to rapidly transform ideas into value is crucial then. So uh, this brings a, a, a new definition to the meaning of innovating under the gun. And finally, you can freeze and get run over. And like the deer, those are your options. Do you fight, do you run, do you freeze, or do you innovate? So let's look at the pace of change from a numerical perspective. So this visualization is gonna describe the evolution of an exponential series in a manner I think that we can all grasp. And I sometimes perform this manually when speaking in front of an audience where I take a piece of paper about 0.01 centimeters in thickness, and I tear it in half, and I put the halves together, and I tear that in half, put those halves together, et cetera. That's an exponential function, right? So to have the same effect, I'm leaving this chart temporarily incomplete. I'm showing the y-axis scale in units of miles, but I'm not revealing the y-axis values. And the x-axis is the number of times that I double the thickness of the stack of paper. There are also four markers along the curve, one at the ninth doubling, one at the 27th doubling, one after the 42nd, and one at the 43rd. So let's see what those are and what their values represent. So if I doubled that 0.01 centimeter piece of paper a mere nine times, the thickness of the stack is now 0.00003181 miles tall. In other words, it's about five centimeters or two inches about the thickness of a ream of paper. So after nine doublings, that's the equivalent of 512 sheets of paper. But if I double that a total of 27 times, that stack is now five and a half miles tall. It's taller than Mount Everest. It's the tallest structure on the planet. So does it look so different from the ninth doubling on the x-axis in terms of deviation from the trend? Not much. And if I did it 15 more times, a total of 42 doublings, that 0.01 centimeter piece of paper, that stack is now halfway to the moon. That's almost 124,000 miles away. So what happened? How did we go from being indistinguishable to zero on the x-axis to halfway to the moon? Well, what we typically don't consider is that as we move right down the x-axis, the technological changes introduced in each iteration represent an aggregate set of innovation enabling capabilities. In other words, the more we innovate, the better we innovate, and the better we innovate, the faster we innovate. And so this is the scenario we're facing. Now I want you to clear your mind now and imagine this. <clears throat> imagine that the series is now a timeline and the start of the series is the industrial revolution in 1790 and the 42nd doubling that's today, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, autonomy, augmented reality, robotics, etc. Now consider all of the technological and societal ramifications that have occurred between those 42 doublings. How many times has society shifted under the weight of those changes over the last 230 years? It represents an immense amount of change and adaptation across the entire world. Now, all of that the impact of all of those advancements and disruptions to society happen all over again, but in the compressed timeline of the very next doubling. All of the ramifications from the Industrial Revolution until today with one more doubling. So can you fathom that? Can you grasp it? So we have to recognize where we are at on the timeline of the exponential curve and find a way to manage only the part of that change that is pertinent and meaningful to our own context. And that requires an agile approach to your innovation management. Otherwise, you'll get lost. So that's the end of story one, uh, where we understand the context and the magnitude of the pace of change and understand that we have to be able to deal with this in our own context for what's pertinent to us. Story two, introduction to innovation management guidance standards. So we'll talk about the genesis 
and the evolution of the definition of innovation management and the recent introduction of the long-awaited innovation management guidance standard. <clears throat> so why are innovation uh, management standards needed? So a fairly recent study found that overwhelming majority of innovation labs worldwide, of those that were surveyed, they were failing. And I know from speaking with Dr. Trusco, the president and CEO of IAOIP, he travels the world meeting business and government leaders and he's routinely peppered with statements that organizations, initi uh, innovation initiatives routinely fail. And we see innovation leadership positions in a constant churn. And there's too much innovation theater that's going on and not enough systems thinking. And there's also been no standardized mechanism to benchmark knowledge of innovation management best practices against. So indeed, why are innovation management standards needed? You know the saying, when everyone's an expert, nobody's an expert. So consider this. If you looked on LinkedIn, there's about 6.3 million people with the word accountant in their title. And if you want to be sure that you have a qualified accountant, you can validate that by hiring a certified public accountant. Let's take a look on the innovation side. There's nearly 5 million people on LinkedIn with the word innovation in their title, and that's exploded over the last three to four years. Now, if you want to be sure that you have a qualified innovation expert in a leadership position, can you validate that? Can you benchmark their knowledge, skills, and abilities against anything? So don't you think that for such an important concept that impacts every aspect of our lives and for which organizations depend to keep up with the pace of change that we should have at the very least a common understanding of the language of innovation, terms, definitions, a common understanding of the available tools, use cases for which they're well-suited, or the link between organizational strategy and portfolio management, the different types of processes and best practices associated with each use case, strategic and tactical and applied research, on and on. So like CPAs, we need that benchmark ability. Billions and billions of dollars are being spent on innovation so that businesses can stay relevant and so that governments can compete and defend themselves from threats. So if you wanted to hire a certified innovation expert, who does the certifying? It needs to be standards-based. So let's look at the guidance documents that are released and those being worked on. So the ones in green are the ones that are already released. But first and most importantly, notice the words in blue near the top. These are guidance documents. These are not going to prescribe a specific approach to implementing a management system for innovation. They tell you what you need to consider to have an effective and efficient innovation program that can produce consistent, repeatable, and valuable outcomes. So ISO 56000 helps to clarify the language, the fundamentals and vocabulary. The ability to communicate effectively is the bedrock of society, and having people speak the same language of innovation is an imperative to allow the free flow of innovation talent among and between different organizations. 56002 provides guidance on realization of value, future-focused leaders, strategic direction, a culture that supports innovation, exploiting insights, managing uncertainty, adaptability, and of course, a systems approach. And 56003 provides guidance on innovation partnerships. So for example, our company, ICS, we created an innovative systems engineering joint venture called Red Team Engineering. You can see it at redteamengineering.com. It was designed specifically to capture a seed on a $7.5 billion DOD contract, and we were successful. The steps we considered in the formulation of that joint venture are provided in 56003, extremely valuable document. 56004 is a guidance standard for the assessment of innovation management systems. This will be crucial for assessors as the move toward auditable standards are made. And if you're a government organization, for example, and you're actively contracting for innovative solutions or providing oversight of that effort, how can you assess whether those entities are positioned to consistently provide value to the government in terms of innovation? This guidance document gives you insight in how to evaluate and assess those entities, and very important. And the rest are in development right now, but they have active working groups, and they'll be coming out over the next year or two. 56,005, guidance on the tools and methods for intellectual property management. And that's crucial knowledge required for managing the expected and desired outcomes of innovation. 56,006 is guidance on management of strategic intelligence, 
56,007. Uh, this is guidance on idea management, something that as recently as 10 years ago was considered to be the essence of innovation management, but in fact, is just one of the many important components of innovation management. Finally, 56,008 provides guidance on both qualitative and quantitative metrics that you need to consider for effective measurement, improvement, and, uh, uh, and monitoring of your innovation management system. So what is an innovation management system? And this is where it kind of gets complicated because without standards, industry was free to define terms and definitions for anything and everything. And that included the concept of innovation management. So our company ICS, we're a client of Gartner, right? So I have access to uh, all their research, all their analysts, et cetera. And I, I've read over 135 Gartner research reports going back to before 2000 to understand the evolution of industry and analyst thinking in this area. So originally, industry defined innovation management in terms of the management of ideas. In fact, there's still a band of thought that considers innovation management only in terms of idea management, when in fact, on the previous slide, I showed that ISO considers, and I say ISO, I'm talking about a, a world group of innovation experts, considers that idea management needs separate guidance document because there are separate processes and sub-processes within that part of the innovation management system. So according to ISO 56002 guidance standard, an innovation management system is a set of interrelated and interacting elements aiming for the realization of value. It provides a common framework to develop and deploy innovation capabilities, evaluate performance, and achieve intended outcomes. That among other things, but that's the general gist here. So what does an IMS or innovation management system entail? It involves taking into account the context of the organization. So if you've done ISO 9001, you know that's important. It's industry trends and market forces, and market trends, and who's your competition, who are the insurgents, um, you know, what are the rules and regulations that you have to adhere to, on and on and on. Everything and anything that can impact your organization uh, has to be taken into account as part of your research. There's leadership and commitment. There's innovation policy, uh, organizational roles and responsibilities. You know, you're talking about from the leadership uh, down to your innovation managers and champions and, and, uh, and the creative types, right? So who does what? Who's responsible for what in your organization? Those are guidance documents that cover these important roles. Um, there's also planning, how to plan to address risk and opportunities and the operation of the innovation process, right? There's other things that covers necessary support for innovation in terms of people, time, knowledge, finance, infrastructure, and all the tools and methods. It's a lot to consider, but doesn't mean that it's overbearing and we've proved that, right? It's not heavy and it doesn't impede the creative aspect of innovation. In fact, what the guidance standards do is tell you what you need to consider. It is not prescriptive. Okay, they tell you what you need to consider to be effective and efficient. And in the next story, we'll discuss how an agile innovation management system can accelerate your innovation activities while also meeting ISO 56000 series guidance criteria. So that's the end of story number two. Uh, and I'm going to move on to story number three now. And this is key considerations for agile innovation management. So the Agile Innovation Master Plan is an Agile Innovation Management System framework created by Langdon Morris of Innovation Labs. Uh, in fact, in my book, I discussed at the introduction of the webinar um, how we implemented the Agile Innovation Master Plan at our company. So the, the framework utilizes uh, five key tracks for the implementation uh, of an Agile Innovation Management System as defined in the Agile Innovation Master Plan. And they derive from five basic questions. Number one, why innovate? This is about strategy, right? Your strategic intent merged with your innovation intent. Uh, you get strategic clarity when your strategy, your strategic intent is married to what you do in your portfolio, right? Your portfolio is what to innovate. It's built and maintained to stay constantly in alignment with strategic objectives whose members and weightings can change due to conditions or events. And we'll go over that in detail in a little bit here in an exercise. But significantly, the portfolio management aspect is crucial. And to me, it's the most important um, because it, it's ensuring what you innovate 
will always be related to the current strategic objectives. And in this era of exponential change, as we discussed at the beginning, any deviation from strategic intent is a waste of resources. How to innovate, right? Again, the guidance standards don't tell you how to do it. There's lots of different ways. You know, there's lean thinking, there's agile, there's lots of different ways. Important point is that it be a rigorous process that ensures the proper integration of knowledge management. And, and if you want to be agile, you need to execute it through agile innovation uh, iterations, right? Or we call them agile innovation sprints in the innovation master plan. Uh, and that ensures things like intelligent fast failures. And I'll tell you the difference between failure and intelligent fast failure in a minute here. The fourth key aspect is course who innovates right and these are the key roles at the very minimum there's three key roles there's leaders champions and your creative types uh, so leadership of course it's the most important and people talk about uh, the barriers to innovation and how culture is so important to get right having done this having implemented this in my organization I can tell you uh, how crucial this is. So understanding the five, tree, five key tracks is less important than how you implement them. And culture has to be first. And you have to start at the top because management and leadership have to absolutely understand the necessity for innovation and they have to understand the importance of linking their strategic intent with the makeup of the innovation portfolio and they have to make sure that they understand all of the different kinds of risk that need to be mitigated uh, in when you are in an innovative uh, organization. So starting a leadership is crucial, but you also need champions, managers, those that can remove uh, roadblocks, people that will manage your portfolio and tie into your current strategic objectives and priorities. And then of course the creative types, and, and we call them creative geniuses, but they can be literally anybody that has the ability to generate unique insight, right? Some people might be very good at, at rigorous scientific methodologies. Other people might have a unique ability to see 360 degrees around a problem. When we call them creative geniuses, we just mean anybody that can create uh, or that can contribute at the creative level. And of course, the last one is where, and this is the infrastructure, right? This is your, your collaboration space, your labs, all the different tools and methods and software that you need for collaboration and, and uh, development and prototype and, and things like that, right? So those are the five key tracks. <clears throat> and we use something called the Agile Innovation Sprint to do both the implementation and the execution of an Agile Innovation Management System. And so the, the Sprint, the Agile Innovation Sprint uses complex thinking, design thinking, and other creative efforts in an iterative sequence, right? So it's got six stages. Uh, so when we use it during the implementation, it results in an acceleration of learning in preparation for your innovation efforts, right? So the same mechanism that you use to implement an Agile Innovation Management System, you use in the operation and execution of the system, right? So, <clears throat> So when you implement this, you do it in such a way that, that all five, when all five key tracks are complete, you have a high level of competency in using the sprints in the execution of your management system. So the keys are first stage, understanding. Second is diverging, right? This is where you, you go out and you get 360 degrees around, uh, around the issue to make sure you have a wide diverse set of endpoints so you can see everything that's necessary and then converge on the key themes or elements uh, before you move into simulation and prototyping, validation, and something that's called the inspective. It's kind of like an agile retrospective. What did we do well? What went wrong? How can we improve, et cetera? So this is, this is the iterative sprint that we use for both implementation and execution. So again, you have the strategic clarity on top, you have the ideal portfolio, you have a rigorous process that ensures intelligent failure. And I'll take a minute here to describe intelligent failure. Um, so integration of knowledge management in your innovation process and ensuring that you've done the effective research that you need to prevent rework or to prevent wasted uh, use of resources, that's the difference between failing and failing intelligently, right? So if you, you know, and I hear this on the internet a lot, people, you know, they promote failing. It's great to fail, it's great to fail. Uh, 
I don't think so. It's great to fail intelligently because you're reaching beyond existing knowledge in the search for new knowledge. And if you fail in that context, and you update knowledge management and you feed forward your learnings into the next iteration or to provide that to other people so that they don't go through the same steps you did, then that's intelligent and that's fine. That's what we're looking for. And you want intelligent failure because that means that you're reaching beyond existing knowledge. Regular failure, not so much. The next one, engaged culture. It's extremely important as I talked about and of course the right tools and you implement these through strategy sprints, portfolio sprints, process sprints, culture sprints, and infrastructure sprints. And those are all engaged, uh, uh, detailed in, in the book. But what we did that's kind of a little bit unique is we added some additional components for extra agility. So before our implementation, we considered everything. We, we took a good look at what was available in the market today. We considered the pace of change. We considered the limitations that we thought that existed among uh, existing uh, innovation management systems uh, and the ideal system uh, to ensure that we could continuously adapt to the pace of change in an agile manner. So we looked at that, did a gap analysis, and we found three things that we needed to add. So, and you'll note something unique about these when I talk about these, because every single one has the word objective in it, and it's important. So the first one, an objective means of selecting from the pool of eligible ideas for the next projects to initiate. What does objective mean in this sense, right? So if you've been innovating for a long time, uh, you've seen this, right? Which is favoritism, undue influence, pet projects, or the inability to let go when you've invested a certain amount of resources over a period of time, and yet the market shifted away and you've got to change directions. You have to pivot, right? So what did we do? We implemented an algorithm to objectively and dispassionately perform certain functions for us. This eliminates subjectivity, increases velocity. So I'll, I'll provide an example of how we do this in a bit. The, the second one is uh, we realize that prototyping needs to be objectively evaluated to ensure intelligent fast failures. Uh, and this means that we have a formula. It's called the functional value of innovation, right? And it allows us to measure the impact of an innovation prototype. It ensures objectivity. It's based on smart metrics. And, and it makes sure that we um, are on the right track for an ROI so we can intelligently can it if it's not moving forward or we can put it into incubation or, or recycle it or whatever. Or we can kill it if the objectives uh, change at the strategic level. So this allows us to quickly determine, are we on the right track or not? And of course, finally, again, and I talked about this as the most important part, the, how you manage your portfolio to me is, is most critical in terms of uh, agile innovation management. You need an automated means of pivoting the portfolio in an objective manner, especially if you're a larger organization and you've got a lot of stuff going on at the same time. And I'm gonna go through an exercise that gives you an example of of how an organization can have changes to its strategy or strategic intent or, or its priorities, and then how the innovation portfolio needs to adapt uh, almost if they're linked directly together, right? And, and that's the key here is, is making sure that you can do this in an objective manner because there's far too much pressure to keep hold of, of uh, projects that you've invested a lot in. But if the market's moving away or, or uh, industry is changing or technology is changing too fast, you got to be able to let go. You got to be able to stop, pivot, and go in another direction. So uh, managing change with agile portfolio management. I want to take a minute to discuss what I believe is the most important part of agile innovation management systems. So managing your portfolio in an agile manager, uh, manner is critical uh, to be proactive in your response to change. So to understand how we create and maintain the right portfolio, you have to uncover the strategic intent and strategic intent can't be defined without a vision. So you got to start at the top. So for the sake of completeness, let's define some terms here. The vision is where you want to be in the future. The strategy is the plan you create to achieve the vision. So for ICS, as an example, uh, our vision is to be the company that everybody wants to work for, everyone wants to do business with, and everyone wants to own. 
Okay. Is that something we're going to achieve? It will be perpetually outside of our grasp, but we're, we have a strategy in place to reach for it. Okay. So the strategic objectives, the next step, these are the measurable steps, the executable steps to achieve your strategy. And the innovation portfolio is the pool of ideas and projects that you should be aligned, that should be aligned to one or more of the strategic objectives in order to develop and deploy the means of successfully executing against the strategy. So the other thing to note here is that the frequency of modification or change increases as you go from the vision to the portfolio. So vision can be so forward looking as to be almost unattainable like ours, whereas the strategic plan to achieve the vision may change periodically and the strategic objectives and their weightings may change more frequently as conditions or events dictate. But because the portfolio is based on the current strategic objectives and their priorities, when those change, you need to pivot. So it stands a reason that agile portfolio management is of crucial importance. So Langdon Morris had this quote, and I, I've just, I've always loved it. He says, to innovate consistently, you have to make a distinction between luck and innovation. Either you have a reliable system for innovation that delivers consistent results, or you hope that your people look into good ideas. Those are the only two options. Which do you prefer? There's another part to this, right? So you hope that your people look into good ideas and that they can execute against those ideas to transform the idea into value. So that those things are important, right? So when you think about this and you play it against the Agile Innovation Master Plan, um, you'll see the importance of having these five key tracks. So real quickly, why is the strategy? What is the portfolio? How is the process? Who is the culture? Where is the infrastructure? But we're only going to talk about the first two in this example. We're going to talk about the why and the what. Strategic objectives in the innovation portfolio. So strategy being derived from vision. For this example, we want to define an example future state that we are passionate about achieving and that will set the stage for the creation of a strategic plan to achieve the vision. So, and I'm gonna do this because our company is, you know, relevant to the Department of Defense. So our vision is to achieve warfighter supremacy in all domains. And I use this terminology because from the recent National Defense Strategy, it plainly states that while we have superiority, we are being contested in every operational domain, air, land, sea, space, cyber. That wasn't the case in the past. And while we may have warfighter superiority, we do not have warfighter supremacy. But it is achievable if we outthink, outmaneuver, and out-innovate the adversary. So that's an example strategy. Again, it's not executable in itself. It's just a plan to achieve the vision. To do that, we have to break down the strategy in the measurable strategic objectives in order to define our strategic intent. All right? So here's an example. Uh, so setting four example strategic objectives for an organization. Okay. We assign weightings to the strategic objectives to denote the current priorities. And I say current priorities because we're going to change these in the next couple of examples. So overall, I've got uh, number one priority is achieving warfighter superiority or supremacy through autonomy, AI, and ML. I'm not saying exactly which type of AI. I'm not saying which type of ML. I'm not saying if it's autonomy for vehicles or fighter jets or whatever. I'm just saying these are the things that we need to do to help us uh, achieve that. Uh, and that's 40% of my resource spend for my innovation portfolio. Streamlining acquisition process for rap rapid acquisition. This is important if you know the history of DOD acquisition or federal government acquisition for that standpoint. But the bottom line is we need to be able to make sure that we are innovating at a faster rate. And that includes how we acquire capability. And, and that's got to go, undergo change. So I'm going to devote a lot of resources there. And of course, agile capability development, we have to transform everything from a, a project waterfall based approach toward agile capability development. So I need to put a certain percentage of resources there. And because we're dealing with taxpayer dollars, we always have to optimize and reduce costs. We're always looking for ways to squeeze out more efficiency. But something happens, right? 
So let's say that we have an international incident or I, I don't know, something happens. Somebody lobs a missile somewhere. We go into a war footing, DEFCON change, right? Even though our strategic objectives may stay the same, the priorities may change, the weightings may change, right? So I'm still, I still have to achieve the warfighter superiority through autonomy, AI, and ML, but I need, I need for my war footing, I need to streamline the acquisition process uh, faster. I need to, to you know, develop agile uh, capability at a, in an agile manner more rapidly, et cetera. And when it comes to optimizing and reduce costs, I may need to defend the nation. I'm not interested right now in, in how much it costs, okay? So this is the kind of thing that you're talking about. Now, if these are uh, uh, connected directly to the management of your portfolio, this can happen seamlessly. And it's always in alignment then with your strategic leadership and your strategic intent. Another scenario on the opposite end, let's say we're in a time of peace and you go through sequestration or budget cuts, et cetera. Well, I still have to achieve war, warfighter superiority because my mission in the DOD is to defend the nation. But um, I'm not on a war footing. So streamlining acquisition is not as important today as it was during a time of war or whatever. Uh, and capability for um, uh, agile capability development, that's always going to be important. But I do need to spend more money on finding ways to optimize and reduce costs because we're in a, a period of budget cuts, right? So this is the kind of thing, that, the kind of thinking that you need to have in order to do this objectively and in an automated uh, fashion. So to dynamically pivot uh, your portfolio of ideas and, and projects, right? They can be considered together in some situations or separate in some situations, but they need to be scored in relation to criteria which can change based on conditions. So there's several with different ways to go about this. And these, I'm not, I'm not prescribing all of them. I'm saying here's about three of them. So number one, strategic objectives. Scoring each idea or project's orientation toward the strategic objective weightings, right? So we have innovation council members that do that. They're, they're competent people, they're trained and certified. You can do it toward the type of innovation, right? So executive leadership sets short, medium, or long-term portfolio weightings and projects are aligned to the right type, again, in an automated fashion. And then risk reward factors, this is common for product-based companies, right? So you have risk factors and reward factors, and you have to consider what the market is uh, needing or the market can bear, right? So again, executive leadership is involved. They're involved in setting the weights in the strategic objectives, in this case, the risk and reward factors, and then competent people score them for closeness of fit. And here's an example. So on the top, we have Reward factors, and I'm listing a few of them. So benefit to customers as an example, revenue potential, competitive advantage, or enhances our brand. The weightings are provided by executive leadership. What's important to the company? They provide the weight, and then the next column, the rating, those are performed by competent people, in our case, certified managers of innovation, that can score them in relation to the strategic objectives. And then you just do a simple multiplication and you have a score. You add them all up and that's your total for your reward factor. You do the same thing for your risk, financial risk, market risk, technology risk, et cetera. Competent people rate against the weighting and you get a score. Now what this provides you is the ability to plot these. You put them on a grid. You can do this in Excel, right? But what you get is on the y-axis, the reward factors and on the x-axis, the risk factors. And you can even set up an area that's a sweet spot, right? A window that's, you know, particular to your organization of where your risk reward ratio exists. And then the items that fall within that, you know, when criteria change, you can automatically reevaluate the portfolio. We took it to the next level by doing this in an automated fashion. It removes subjectivity completely. And finally, I'll give you a quick overview of what, our innovation uh, system looks like from a diagram perspective. So way back in 2017, we integrated the high level structure of ISO management standards into our innovation process using the plan, do, check, act uh, cycle, the PDCA cycle, right? So or the Deming cycle as it's called. So this was about th almost three years before ISO 56002 standard came out 
uh, that provided guidance on the benefits of doing the same, right? But we did it because we're an avid ISO 9001 practitioner and, and, and we wanted to ensure a system uh, approach. We wanted to make sure that we had, uh, it was process oriented, it was auditable, that it prevented rework, it ensured an effective and efficient use of our resources to maximize our ROI, that we considered the context of the organization, risk and opportunity management, knowledge management, uh, research for trends, forecasts, customer needs and requirements, market needs, et cetera. And then everything else is, is you have a high level uh, strategic flow, and then you've got a tactical flow on the internal side, which is observe, orient, decide, and act. So along the way, we've, we've made sure that we have alignment for strategy, right, and culture. We have portfolio management and metrics. We have a rigorous process that uh, ensures uh, consistent outcomes, prototyping and evaluation objectively, fast intelligent failures that both take from and feed knowledge management, right? Those are all important uh, aspects for our agile innovation management system. So that's the end of story number three. Uh, we are about 48 minutes in and I'll be glad to take any questions. So. Uh, Danica, if you want to jump in here. Absolutely. Um, anyone who might have a question, you are welcome to hit the Q&A button. You also can just hit the chat pod, but just know if you, uh, with the chat pod, um, that will come directly into Tom. Um, do we have any questions right now? And Brett, I see that you're on. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself and say a few words, or if you have some questions also. Tom, we thank you though. This was um, very exciting. I learned a few new things today. You bet. So one question that came in is, uh, will we have access to the slide deck? Yes, we are going to have a complete recording today um, that will go into the learning management system and everyone who attended, you will receive a link for this if you'll just give us a couple of days to get it posted. So you'll be able to go through that. Hi, Tom. There's a question from Tom Triumph for you, Tom. That was a fun one to say. How might we be able to go through training? What's involved in getting certified? I am going to um, let Tom and Brett speak to that if you'd like to, especially Tom, since you've gone through it. Um, if you would say a few words. Yeah, sure. So uh, I and my organization have gone through various levels of training and certification at IAOIP or through IAOIP. Uh, we have six certified managers of innovation uh, in ICS, in our organization, and it's, it's extremely important. Um, as far as uh, training and uh, you know, certification to be in alignment with uh, ISO 56000 series standards, I know for a fact that we have our um, members of our uh, U.S. Technical Advisory Group, and I don't know if Brett can jump in and talk about this, but we have members of our U.S. Technical Advisory Group that are working with uh, an international organization uh, called DECRA uh, that is uh, going to be providing that kind of training in concert with IAOIP uh, for, the, uh, for the ISO Aligned uh, Innovation Management uh, uh, Guidance. And I, I can jump in and say, uh, yeah, we, as a matter of fact, we've got Frank Bull, uh, Rick Fernandez, we've got Langdon Morris are all on this call. Uh, I believe Julio Fuster is also uh, does uh, certification prep classes. Uh, one of the things about being an ISO accredited certifying body is we, we can't force anyone to take any training from us. So if anyone says you need to be certified by taking training from them, uh, they can't be ISO certified. So they're, they're, people out there who can do the certification prep classes, as well as anybody on this call that wants to become certified and then start offering their own uh, training classes. Um, we're, we're happy to work with, with anyone in the community. I see Tom's got his hand up. <clears throat> I think that might've come from Tom Triumph. Um, Tom, one of the things that I really enjoyed hearing you speak about, because I, you always hear, you know, failure is not an option, but you talked about intelligent failure, um, which I loved. Do you expand on that a little bit in the book or, or can you um, maybe talk a little bit more about the process there and how, um, and, and how you think that that leads to, you know, better innovation or better anything, I would say. Sure. That. 
Yeah, sure. I, yeah, of course, I, I talk about it a lot in the book. Um, but uh, the basic concept was, you know, when we were putting together our Agile Innovation Management System, that was one of the things that kind of rubbed me the wrong way because you hear people talking about failure and how important failure is. Now, in some contexts, it's just about the only way you can learn. Right. So as uh, if you imagine uh, starting a business, right, you hear business owners talk about this a lot. Right? We have to be able to uh, go through a failure before we can achieve success. Yet on the on the same hand, I know people who have literally done the preparation, done the research that are necessary to be prepared to succeed and then followed through on a well-established plan and, and executed against it and did not ever ex experience uh, a failure, right? But understanding that's, that's using the experience of others, right? So when we talk about knowledge management and innovation, it's, it's using what we've learned in the past or others have learned in the past. On a business perspective, it's learning about what other failures people have experienced so that we can also benefit from their failure so that we don't have to. And that's the point of an intelligent failure is we should only be failing if we're trying something that is truly new, right? That's the definition. That's the intelligent failure rate metric. And I, I put this metric in a, in a competition last year uh, that was run by, uh, I think uh, it was Spigot at the time, uh, but, uh, but it took number one because the concept was so it was novel, right? It was like, oh, that's that's definitely how we should think about failures. It's making sure that we're not retreading the same ground. It's making sure that we are learning from our mistakes and others' mistakes in order to make sure that we're being efficient and effective uh, in our innovation attempts. Wonderful. And if I, and if, well, Danica, I'm sorry. This is Brad. That's okay. If I, can, if I can add to that, you know, this is something that I hear from a lot of entrepreneurs who are successful that uh, you, you contact a funder and the funder says, well, how many have you failed? Well, no, I've had 10 successful businesses. They've all made a lot of money for a lot of people. Are you telling me I have to fail to, to get funding? And the, the message that we're giving the world is yes, but gosh, you know, if I wanna go have an appendectomy and I call a surgeon, I'm not gonna say, well, how many times have you killed people? No, I don't want a surgeon that's killed people. I want a surgeon that's pr proven his success. So the failures are in recognizing problems early and correcting them as fast as possible so that you don't go down a fork in the road that's going to you know, take you out of business later or cause you really expensive problems. So that's all fantastic points. And Tom, we actually have several questions that have yes. come in through the q and I, I can um, go after them. Okay, I was about to say you can go after them or I can give them to you. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see here. So uh, what challenges do you find working with clients to determine the criteria and weighting to prioritize strategic objectives? And this is important. So uh, as I had mentioned that we discussed, uh, or we are uh, innovating uh, on behalf of the DOD. So a lot of times we are, we are doing two things. Number one, we can innovate in conjunction with a client or two, we can innovate in an unsolicited manner uh, on behalf of a client. And this is something that we've done in the past. So we looked at, for example, one of our uh, DOD clients, there's an agency uh, that's a client of ours. They publish their, uh, their strategic plan, their strategic objectives, their goals, vision, et cetera, on their website. They update it on a yearly basis. So for us, it's, it, it's easy to see where they put their priority, uh, where they put their um, their weight and resources, et cetera. And so we can align our, our innovation uh, on their behalf uh, in a very easy manner. Uh, there are other organizations that keep those close to their chest, right? So as an example, the, the National Defense Strategy, when it came out, there's a public version, and then there's a classified version. We don't see the classified version, right? But what we saw was a top-level uh, uh, change in strategy at the top that filtered down through, you know, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, through the combatant commands, unified commands, all the agencies, field units, et cetera. Everybody's strategy changed all the way down. Some of them get posted, right? Some of them don't. Some of them, they're not going to let you know, uh, right? So unless you're intricately involved with them and aligned in a program that's innovating on their behalf, they're not going to publish stuff like that. So the challenge is, number one, 
understanding that you need to have a, a, a very good methodology for eliciting uh, requirements management. We use the CMMI dev um, uh, process for that. Um, but, but you're right, there are some scenarios where it's challenging because they, they keep them close to the vest. Uh, but we've been successful even in an unsolicited fashion when we identified uh, what their uh, needs are and then we innovate on their behalf and present them with solutions which then they take in and implement, right? Saving six million dollars over the last four years as an example. So uh, anyway, that's that's a, a best I can answer that one right now. Um, uh, let's see, there's another question. What was the biggest challenge you faced in implementing your system? Where did you get hung up? Uh, kind of in alignment with um, another question. The, the, the first part is culture. First part was culture, right? So um, you, you go into an organization. When the CEO brought me in, he said, we, we understand we have to be in a more innovative organization. We have to make sure that we are in alignment with our clients and are capable of delivering innovative solutions for our clients. Um, we had sporadic. Uh, innovation capability and innovation results in the past, but we had no system, right? But it's an organization at the time was a very, uh, I would say, heads down, nose to the grindstone, you know, one foot in front of the other uh, organization that was dedicated on making sure that you just continuously uh, knocked things out, right? So it was a very um, results-oriented business and not very uh, oriented toward taking risk. And so culture was the very first important thing. And what we did is we made sure that we got the executive management level from the CEO, the COO, myself, um, let's see, our service delivery, uh, sales and marketing. We had our engineering. We had our uh, just everybody at different layers. All of them got trained and certified. So we had the same understanding of the need for alignment between strategy, portfolio, process, culture, infrastructure, and that we could be in alignment with the language of innovation. So to me, that was the biggest part. and It was the most important and crucial aspect to get right. Uh, let's see, another one. Uh, uh, can you talk about the difference in the agile innovation sprint process between iterative platform and breakthrough level innovation? So again, this is, um, this is one of the things that uh, when we look at ISO 56000 series guidance, standards. This is one of the benefits that we're going to get out of this because the language of innovation is is all over the place right now. For instance, if you were to do a search on Google today uh, for the types of innovation, uh, and I did this as an exercise in preparation for my book, as a matter of fact, you would find well over 100 different quote types of innovation. And you would find a lot of different innovation experts giving different definitions for what each of them are. And that's a problem because that means we're not communicating properly. We don't have a common understanding. I understand the concept here. And this is why I talked about when I, I balance the portfolio or we balance the portfolio, we give management multiple axes on which they can uh, be involved. It's not getting their fingers in what's going into the portfolio, but managing the construct of the portfolio. So number one, strategic objectives and priorities. Number two, the quote, type of innovation, meaning the, the, the near, the mid, and the long term, right? So what you call it, whether breakthrough is long term or iterative is short term or platform is midterm, that's immaterial. The fact that you have a near, mid, and long term is more important because uh, that understands the level of investment that management or, or executive leadership is willing to make. So when you have an idea that fits a gap in the portfolio that's related to long term, the chances are that's going to be more toward uh, the structure and, and the uh, effort that you need to uh, develop a breakthrough type innovation. It's simply, it's simply a greater effort. Uh, let's see. Uh, anything else? Uh, Frank Vol asks, how does business continuity risk standard ISO 22301 tie into the process or does it? And I, I, I wish I had a great answer to that, Frank, because I'm, I am not a business continuity risk guy. Um, and it certainly would be pertinent at a time like today, but I'd be, I'd be definitely willing to, to follow up with you and, and, uh, and consider that. 
Um, another question was, can you speak to independent innovation management platform tools? What is the state of the art versus the standards? What are the success rates, challenges of building innovation management platform with existing enterprise tools? Great question. So as I mentioned earlier, I am, uh, or ICS is, uh, all you can consume Gartner client, right? So I know, and I keep up on the research of all of the different innovation management platforms that are out there. And there's a lot of them like, you know, Bright Idea and Plan View and, and uh, uh, Idea Scale. And I, I don't want to leave anybody out because there's so many of them. And both Gartner and Forrester do some incredible uh, research and evaluation on this. And I've gone through both of those in the last week and a half, as a matter of fact. 2020 just had one came out from Forrester. Uh, I think it was late 2019 or August or October of 2019. Uh, Gartner just had one. So they listed uh, what the capabilities are for each. I don't want to get in trouble with any one of them, uh, but but I I don't uh, look at them myself because, again, when, when I went to implement this in place, I looked at them to see what their capabilities were. And at the time, they did not have those three key components that I needed. And our organization is extremely mature in the area of analytics and measurement. So we... Uh, decided to do our own, implement our own instead of use something that was commercially available. But the evolution of those innovation management platforms, uh, it's, it's night and day from where they were just a few years ago. Um, but uh, but I'm, I'm not going to call out one or the other on those. Uh, let's see, anything else here? Biggest, uh, I already did that one. Uh, any idea on how to implement this in old companies? For example, a 30 year old, what's the first step, culture change or whatever. I think this one I kind of answered because our company is 23 years old. I consider that having been around the block for a while um, and definitely culture change was absolutely the first step. Uh, in my book, I talk about the, the order of understanding of the five key tracks and the order of implementation of the five key tracks. And, and implementation is different than understanding. Understanding has to be done to, to, to make sure you're organizationally prepared to implement. And then implementation is to make sure that you have the greatest chance of success. So uh, I, I would say you're going to have to read the book on that one if you would uh, like to get some more information. Uh, uh, how do you incorporate open innovation into your IMS? Great question. So in our IMS, we have an open innovation portal. Right, so we allow all interested parties. That means anybody that can impact ICS or anybody that ICS can impact to be able to uh, register and submit ideas and go through the whole open innovation process using our own custom design portal. And we custom designed it because we have a, a back end that we feed into and things like that and that we manage our, you know, how we go from idea to project and things like that. So uh, definitely, we, we, we built our own front end for that. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's cloud-based. Uh, I think, I think we've, I think that most all questions have been answered yeah. at this time. Um, Tom, uh, Brett unfortunately had to uh, leave the room, but on behalf of IOIP, we are so grateful that you came in today and shared your knowledge and um, gave such a compelling um, amount of information for everyone to think about. We appreciate you so much. For anyone who is interested, Tom's email is right up on the screen, uh, braz at icsinc.com. You can also find his book in Amazon. I have a direct link to it, or if you received any of our emails, you should be able to also link to it as well. We will provide the link. Um, to the book when we provide you also with a copy of today's uh, or, or the ability to access, I should say, today's um, live stream with Tom. Tom, is there anything else you'd like to add at the end? And then I'd like to introduce our next um, speaker that will come up in April, Tom Triumph. Um, but we'd certainly love to hear from you and your wrap up. If no, you... I, the only thing I just want to say real quick is, is I, I think I provided my email address and there it is at the top of the yes. last slide, braz at icsinc.com. Feel free to just, you know, ping me a question anytime you want. That's all. Wonderful. Wonderful. We so appreciate you. Um, 
I am going to actually I if for I'm going to open this up and allow Tom Triumph, who is also an IOIP supporter. We have been lucky to have him with us before um, in a live stream, and he is also going to be here next month. So I am going to um, allow Tom to say a few words. We realize that we are a little bit over on the hour, but we so appreciate everyone for joining us today. And uh, this will be our final um, opportunity to hear from Tom. Tom, are you there? Yeah, I just Wonderful. unmuted myself. Can you hear me? We sure can. Thank you so yeah, much. So first of all, thanks, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Tom Brazil, so much for the really interesting talk, and and thanks, folks, for sticking on just another thirty seconds. I very much, very much look forward to speaking speaking with everybody on April twenty first. I've got some really good information to go through. Um, obviously, you know, all of us are involved in innovation and moving companies forward. And I'm going to talk about what I call intentional evolution and how we as innovators and uh, creative people can impact the five pillars of every organization. So um, it's a real opportunity for us to have an impact across the entire organization. Um, although all too often innovation really it's only considered uh, applicable to products and services, right? But there's many other areas. So I want to try to do an informative and an engaging webinar. Uh, we'll talk about those five fundamental pillars common in every organization. I've got real world stories. Uh, I involve things I've learned from some great luminaries in the world. Uh, some people I know quite well, some people I don't know. I don't want to be a name dropper because like my friend Bono said, uh, don't be a name dropper. That, that's a bad joke. But anyway, uh, that's a short story. I look forward to it. I've got some uh, great information to share. And uh, I couldn't think of a better group of people to do it with. So Wonderful. I'll see everybody on April 21st. We thank you so much. On behalf of the International Association of In Innovation Professionals, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to your feedback and your comments. And Tom, we thank you so much for being here. Um, with us today. And with that being said, we're going to um, stop the meeting and everyone please enjoy your day, stay safe, and we'll see you soon.